Australia's new Prime Minister says his party is ready to take charge. I do want to change the country. I want to change the way that politics operates in this country. The Liberal Party bleeds blue ribbon seats, losing key spots on several fronts. A historic result for the Greens in Queensland, winning at least two seats. And Joe Biden congratulates Anthony Albanese on his win ahead of this week's quad meeting in Japan. Hello and welcome to ABC News. I'm Lara Hines. Anthony Albanese will be sworn in as Australia's 31st Prime Minister tomorrow, vowing to bring the country together as Labor returns to power for the first time in almost a decade. The latest counting shows it could reach a majority in Parliament. Currently, it has 72 of the 76 seats required. Otherwise, it will rely on the support of the crossbench, which could swell to 16, including up to seven so-called teal candidates. Anthony Albanese claimed victory shortly after 11pm when it became clear only the ALP would be able to form government. Scott Morrison says he will step down as leader of his party and shed a tear today as he appeared at church. It leaves the Liberals weighing up their future after their moderate wing was decimated. We've got our full team standing by for complete coverage and analysis. National Affairs correspondent Greg Jennett begins our coverage. <laughs> The 21st of May made the 31st Prime Minister. Now unmistakably ascendant... I know at the beginning of the campaign they said people didn't know me, but I reckon they've got it. ..and impatient to get started. No matter how you voted today, the government I lead will respect every one of you every day. And tomorrow, together, we begin the work of building a better future. His path towards power was at first more slogging than sweeping. I, I was confident, of, but not complacent about a result. Through a night of counting that confounded and confused. Everybody's saying it tonight. The boat is fracturing all over the place. Seats tumbled across the board, not in ways predicted, more patchwork than pendulum. Greens went up with at least three seats in sight. It was a green slide. Their gains were at Labor and Liberal expense. The ALP's highest profile casualty fell to an independent while trying to make the switch from Senate to House. But wins eked out in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia and a swathe cut through the West. And it's 10.2% swing in Western Australia and that is the standout result. It's pushed its tally and confidence ever upwards, even if its national vote was down. A win is a win is a win. And <laughs> that is true. On 31.7% yeah. 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 in every state I mean, except for WA. But, but less, less than a third no, of Australians say, have voted for yeah. you. Liberals lamented a blue tide that ran out. I still believe in miracles. <laughs> Its deepest problem now, a massive loss of faith. I've always been prepared to accept their verdicts, and tonight they have delivered their verdict. The verdicts against Liberals were final. The sentences, brutal. Maybe after tonight I get a bit more time to try and be the most extraordinary dad. Josh Frydenberg's career is for now over. The hopes of mentors for a future Prime Ministership dashed. I salute Josh Frydenberg, who is very much um, on my mind and in my heart at the moment. I hope you know, that there may be a miracle that will keep him in Parliament. In just one night, a torrent of teal-clad women washed the bluest of blue ribbon seats away. Our government wasn't listening to us. So we've changed the government. Five on the East Coast, perhaps a sixth in Perth. We do know we will no longer be taken for granted. Their movement for climate change, integrity and equality shook the foundations at the core of the so-called Liberal Broad Church. Safe Liberal seat, two-term incumbent, independent. 
They'll lead Parliament's incoming Class of 2022, featuring around 15 new women members. This election's exposed the brittle fault line beneath the two-party system and the power of voters looking for alternatives. The crossbench will be occupied as never before. Space will be needed for at least 15 representatives. And even if they don't vote as a bloc, they'll still be a potent reminder each and every sitting day of the 47th Parliament that the major parties ignore disillusioned voters at their peril. Greg Jennett, ABC News. Canberra. Let's bring Insider's host David Spears now. David, it was a bruising night for the Coalition, but it wasn't the thumping win for Labor as some polls predicted. Well, Lara, a win is a win. This is the lowest primary vote for a Labor government we've seen. That can't be ignored. It's a result of this extraordinary shift towards independence and Greens. But there's enough support coming back to Labor in preferences to put them on track now for a majority of at least 76 seats. Which means Anthony Albanese most likely won't need any of this enormous new crossbench to govern in his own right. Just hours after claiming victory, the Prime Minister-elect has been rushed into national security briefings today, ahead of his visit to Japan for the Quad Leaders Summit. He's looking relaxed and relieved after delivering his party government after three long terms in opposition. Here's political reporter Matthew Doran. <laughs> The Sunday morning meander for a caffeine hit takes on a slightly different vibe. Just another normal day in Marrickville. Australia's Prime Minister-elect, weary after a big night. Did you get much sleep last night, I, I got a little bit. Jimmy Barnes did ring at 3.29am. <laughs> But Anthony Albanese's message still easy to decipher. I want to change the way that politics operates in this country. The first order of business, making it official, with a trip to the Governor-General tomorrow, along with a band of four Labor lieutenants. They'll all be sworn into uh, multiple portfolios uh, tomorrow. Anthony Albanese already receiving briefings on the complexity of Australia's foreign ties before heading to Tokyo for the Quad meeting with the leaders of the United States, Japan and India. There is a change of government. Uh, there will be some changes in policy, particularly with regard to climate change and our engagement uh, with the world. Will you be on the plane to Tokyo to join uh, the, um, the new Prime Minister at the Quad meeting? Uh, no. The focus for the summit, Beijing's increasing assertiveness. China under President Xi has uh, sought to shape the world around it in a way that we've never seen before and that does present challenges for the nation. From summits overseas to those closer to home, the new Prime Minister keen to spruik a new spirit of cooperation with state and territory leaders. I will be asking uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, the, this afternoon uh, to also uh, organise for there to be a meeting held face to face uh, in Canberra over coming weeks uh, with all of the state premiers and chief ministers. And while the party basks in the glory of electoral success, there are serious questions about some decisions made during the campaign. Not least Labor's attempt to parachute heavy hitter Christina Keneally into a safe seat. We will look into that result in detail, learn the lessons that we can from it. Another frontbencher, Terry Butler, losing her seat to the Greens in Queensland. Anthony Albanese pledging to be more ambitious on climate. Together we can end the climate wars. And giving Australia's First Nations a voice to Parliament. I commit to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in Perth. Decades ago, Anthony Albanese put these numbers up outside his mother's humble public housing flat here in Camperdown. It's a long way, physically, and symbolically from the lodge. And after a campaign fought on issues of character, he now has the opportunity to put his rhetoric that he'll lead a government for all Australians into practice. My mother dreamt of a better life for me, and I hope that my journey in life inspires Australians to reach for the stars. A journey about to put him on the world stage. Great neighbourhood. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Sydney. A disastrous night for the Liberals saw the party lose its traditional blue ribbon seats, knocking out a swag of moderate MPs in the process, along with heavy losses to Labor in metropolitan Perth. With Scott Morrison set to stand down, the search for a new leader has begun. As political reporter Jane Norman explains, they'll need to reshape the party and rebuild its base. A final dash through the gates of Kirribilli House. Home for the past three and a half years, 
returning to his touchstones. I'm very pleased that the last thing I say as PM is here. Dejected and rejected, he turned to a passage about finding joy in the midst of troubled times. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. But there was no salvation last night. And as a result, I will be handing over the leadership at the next party room meeting to ensure that the party can be taken forward under new leadership. Voters delivered their verdict, deserting the Liberal Party and the man who led it. From Perth to Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, heartland seats were lost to Labor, the Greens and a wave of teal women running on an integrity platform. That is perhaps the loudest message to the Liberal Party and it's the one that we are going to have to heed most strongly. Questions abound after the scale of the defeat and in its wake, plenty of Liberals are offering answers. From pre-selection delays and controversial candidates to inflammatory rhetoric on China. Not necessarily our strong stance on China, but some of the, the messaging that have been used. In particular, the words, drums of war. But one issue stood out most starkly, climate. Now, calls for greater ambition. We are uh, looking like we will exceed that 2030 position of 26 to 28 per cent. We should commit uh, to being able to go further. Australia has not been well served by the cultural wars uh, on climate change. Stoked by the Liberals' partner, the Nationals, considered a massive drag on the vote in progressive seats. One senior moderate not ruling out a coalition split. The National Party need to look at uh, where the Liberal Party has felt this pain and reflect upon uh, how it is that we together uh, can manage to form majority government in the future. In a contest largely about character, Scott Morrison's proved to be the greatest liability, particularly with women. Female voters felt alienated by him and abandoned his party. But the Liberals' woman problem has been building for years. Perhaps it'll take this route for the party to take it seriously. Well, we need to get more women into Parliament. Josh Frydenberg is plotting his own path back, but for now, his leadership aspirations will have to wait. Conservative hardhead Peter Dutton is considered the front-runner to take the reins. Angus Taylor and Dan Tien also in the mix. Perhaps a female candidate too. It is way too early at this stage to, to even have a discussion about uh, leadership. Whoever prevails will be leading a shattered party that's lost its way. Jane Norman, ABC News, Sydney. Let's bring in the political editor Andrew Probin and 7.30 political correspondent Laura Tingle now. Andrew, first to you. Some seats still in doubt, but it does look like Labor's heading towards a majority government. Have voters enthusiastically embraced Anthony Albanese? Well, that's one of the extraordinary things about this election campaign and the result, because Anthony Albanese becomes Prime Minister with the primary support for the Labor Party going backwards. In fact, Labor is the first party to win government from opposition with a declining vote. Uh, now, the other element of this election campaign and the result is that support for miners now is about a third. This could be a permanent element of, of uh, politics from here on. Anthony Albanese's job is to show the two-thirds of voters who parked their votes uh, other than uh, uh, Labor Party uh, that he is the right man at the right time. And Laura, Labor's primary vote that Andrew's talking about there may well have been suppressed by this extraordinary shift in support behind independents and Greens. What sort of parliament are we looking at as a result with this wave of crossbenchers coming in? Well, as we've heard, we're not sure about whether there'll be a majority government or not, but whether there is or there isn't, I think the message for uh, both sides of politics in terms of the major parties, and particularly for the government in the way it runs the parliament, is that it will have to... Uh, acknowledge that there is this uh, very different makeup of the parliament. Even if it can get through legislation on its own, it will have to acknowledge that people want the parliament to be a place of debate and discussion 
and uh, of the capacity to bring ideas forward uh, from outside the government and have them genuinely listened to. So I think we'll see a lot more uh, capacity for private members' bills, uh, a, a much more consultative parliament than we've seen in the past. And Andrew, just quickly back to the point you made earlier about whether this is going to be a permanent shift in the landscape. I guess that really depends on how this works over the coming few years. Absolutely. We have a, a really strange parliament before us now. It's of multi-coloured. Uh, the crossbench is going to be enormous. And while the Labor Party might get that majority in the lower house, it's the Senate where laws are going to be passed. There are going to be uh, independents there in possibly greater number, more Greens. So the the pursuit of consensus is going to be important because if that's not achieved, then there could be a backlash at the next election. OK, thank you, Andrew and Laura. That's where we'll leave the election centre for now. We'll be back with Anthony Green and the rest of the team shortly. This election will also be known as Independence Day after a tidal wave of teal candidates caused multiple upsets in seats once held by Prime Ministers and Liberal leaders. The group campaigned on issues including climate and integrity but also capitalised on the coalition's neglect for half of the population. Bridget Rollison reports. I am one, watch me Never underestimate the power of women. The biggest voting cohort turning a wave of once blue ribbon seats teal. What we have achieved here is extraordinary. Our climate has changed. Yeah! As strong professional women overwhelmingly convinced voters by challenging both parties to do more on climate change, government accountability and gender equality. We just wanted somebody who would represent us. So many young people have been disillusioned for so, so long. I just felt like... It's about time for women not to be irrelevant. The coalition's been accused of moving too far away from the centre and losing swathes of voters, particularly women who were fed up feeling like their government didn't listen to them. We really need to hear from professional women. It's, I feel for the very first time my vote's been heard. I think a lot of women are speaking uh, with their vote yesterday. You can't forget about 50% of the population. You look at the values of this community, we are socially progressive, we are environmentally focused, they were not reflected in the parliament. People were feeling ignored, neglected and taken for granted for way too long. Even after Scott Morrison's term was dogged by the treatment of women in parliament, the issue was largely forgotten during the election campaign, but not by voters. What we saw last night was that the warning signs weren't heeded. In 2019, only 35% of women put their vote with the coalition and the coalition hasn't listened that women want more. Kylie Tink, Sophie Scamps, Allegra Spender, Zoe Daniel, Monique Ryan and Kate Cheney are all expected to unseat Liberals in a teal tidal wave, joining Helen Haynes and Zali Stegel in Parliament. And it's a cohort that clearly we have failed to have represent us in sufficient numbers uh, and we need to make sure we turn that around. From journalists to doctors to business owners, many of these women already held high profiles in their electorates before the backing of groups like Climate 200. But there are also mums who wanted change. I don't know anyone else like my mum. She's the strongest person I know. And <laughs> she's done such a great job. Bridget Willison, ABC News. The so-called green slide in Queensland has seen the Greens sweep in as a third force on the political stage. They are claiming victory in two inner-city Brisbane seats and may win another. It's a result that will no doubt lead to some soul-searching for Labor, which failed to pick up climate-conscious voters in key seats. A historic moment <laughs> as the changing sentiment of a city is brought into focus. Once fringe candidates, now heroes of the climate movement. And they said we couldn't do it. <laughs> the ALP widened its microscopic margin in Lily. But it's not a campaign 
it's a camp pleasure. But it's left wondering how it alienated inner city voters. There has been a lot of demographic change in recent years uh, with lots more young people moving in uh, and a very strong environmental consciousness. Buoyed by the explosion of support, Adam Brandt flew into Brisbane to celebrate the Green Wave. This election didn't just change a government, it was a green slide. Architect Elizabeth Watson-Brown stealing Ryan from the LNP with an 11% swing. The, the tectonic plates uh, are shifting in politics in Australia and I think we're here at the beginning. They've won Griffith, once a seat held by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. If there's one message out of this election, it's that people feel completely disconnected from the major parties. Brisbane saw a 5% swing to the Greens. It's a nose out in front from Labor. I am cautiously optimistic as the count continues. And they've scored a seat in the Senate. I am so excited that Queenslanders have chosen to send a regional teacher from Gladstone to the Senate. There were no Teal candidates in Queensland. Tom Jordan has always voted Labor, but put the Greens first this time. I didn't feel like I could do that with a good conscience, really. And um, I think a lot of people that are uh, left-wing have done the same as a sort of protest vote. Climate, affordable housing and health care weighing heavily on his mind. Starting to think about buying a house as well and... It just seems like that's just going to be impossible. The coalition is also counting its losses here. The political landscape in Australia has changed. With big swings against it in Ryan and Brisbane, the Greens now a true third force in Australian politics. And it's happening from Greensland. <laughs> Lexi Hamilton-Smith, ABC News, Brisbane. And back in Sydney, Labor performed well in the West. The party increased its margin in several seats and picked up the inner West electorate of Reid. However, Senator Christina Keneally has conceded the seat of Fowler. While many independents have succeeded by focusing on the big issues, one of them has benefited from going hyper-local. I think the Fowler community is saying, look, we're going to have our own voice. We're going to stand up, we're going to speak up for ourselves. The Fairfield deputy mayor campaigned heavily on the harsh COVID restrictions in Sydney's southwest. I think the lockdown brought our community together, and I think that's, you know, the, the number of people who said, you know, thank you for standing up for us, who came to the pre poll and told me that was just amazing. Conceding defeat on social media this evening, Labor's Christina Keneally congratulated Miss Lee and thanked her own volunteers. It leaves the former Premier and Senator out of Parliament altogether. When I chose to stand for this seat, I did so because I, believe, I wanted this community to have a strong and experienced voice at the centre of government. She was parachuted in, sidelining outgoing MP Chris Hayes' pick to Lee. They didn't end up with that. I feel like that was a big mistake on their part. Having someone just of our culture, understanding the area and, and having her represent us and, and knowing our struggles, I think will be a good step forward for us. There's a real sense here in Fowler that Labor misread how safe the seat would be. The ALP hoped Christina Keneally's high profile and political clout would spare her. It appears that hasn't happened. Labor also ran a candidate from outside the electorate in Parramatta. While down on first preferences, Andrew Charlton will hold on to the seat for the ALP. The party has seen favourable swings in Macquarie, Greenway and notably the bellwether seat of Reid. We were very pleasantly surprised by the result. I hope that's a really strong message that people receive, that diversity in our parliament is important, not just for diversity's sake, but because of what we bring to the new parliament. A parliament that's about to welcome many new faces. Tim Swanston, ABC News, Sydney. Australia has a new Prime Minister-elect, but will Mr Albanese be governing in majority or negotiating with a crossbench? Let's head back to our election centre and David Spears, who is standing by with Anthony Green. Labor has emerged victorious, but majority government is still a few seats away. Anthony Green has been going through the latest numbers. Anthony, will Labor be able to pick up enough seats to govern in its own right? Well, at the moment, we're giving Labor a definite 73 seats. I'm pretty, pretty confident that I have 73. That, three, that includes McNamara and Richmond, which are complex three-cornered contests, which we think Labor is better positioned to win. 
Now, beyond that, you've got to go into some of the doubtful seats. Uh, we'll bring up some of the, the seats remaining in doubt. Um, Canberra suddenly popped up there, which is just to do with the preference count. Labor's easy one, Canberra. Um, the Labor Party's on 50.9 in Deakin. They're on 50.9 in Benelong. So they're the next two seats. So with Canberra, that gets Labor to 76 seats, and that's the, the bare majority. Beyond that, Labor is... Uh, and I've now dropped behind in Gilmore, so these are, these are updating figures. And Lyons, Labor is still ahead. So we think Labor can get to 76 seats. There's an outside chance of 77, but there's still a lot more counting to come. This is a patchy result. How's the national vote settling now for the two parties? Well, we've got the two-party preferred. Labor's on 52.2, the Coalition on 47.8. That corresponds to a 3.7% swing. Now, on election night, that wasn't translating into enough. That's just barely enough to get Labor in the majority, but it wasn't looking like that initially. The big change came when Western Australia came in, and this is the big point, 10.8% swing, a massive swing in Western Australia, and it's Western Australia that has made the position where the Albanese government could actually have a majority. All right, Anthony Green, thank you. OK, let's now hear from the Labor camp and one of the incoming ministers who will form part of Anthony Albanese's cabinet. Linda Burney, thanks for joining us and congratulations. Thanks for joining us and congratulations. Thank you, David, and good evening. Now, this is an historic election outcome for a number of reasons, including the number of Indigenous members of the Labor caucus uh, as of these results. What does this mean for Indigenous Australians? Well, pr providing we win the seat of Lingiari, which is looking very positive, there will be six First Nations people in the Labor Party caucus, um, three in the Senate, and three in the House of Representatives, including uh, a medical doctor, Gordon Reid, from, uh, from the seat of Robertson. It is historic. If you'd said to me, David, five years ago, we're going to have six people um, in the 2022 election, I would not have believed it was possible. What it will mean for the Labor caucus is it will assist enormously in the task that we've got ahead, particularly the implementation in full of the Uluru Statement. Well, I want to ask you about that in a moment, but as someone who's about to become the Indigenous Affairs Minister, of course, you'll be replacing Ken White, who's lost his seat, uh, as well as lo losing government. Do you have any sympathy for Ken White? Are you sorry to see him leave the Parliament altogether? Ken White sent me the most gracious message this morning, which I really appreciated. And I assured him in my response that the work that he has done towards uh, constitutional recognition and the work that he has done in his portfolio will not be a waste. It would be wrong for me as the incoming uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister to jettison all the work that's been done over the last few years. So I wish Ken well, I know him well, and as I said, he, he sent a very gracious message to me this morning. So what are the next steps when it comes to enshrining in the Constitution an Indigenous voice to Parliament? We heard Anthony Albanese in his victory speech last night really emphasise the importance of this. What happens now from here? Well, what's really wonderful, David, is that the Shadow Cabinet and the caucus is of, at one in terms of the implementation of the Uluru Statement. Just very briefly, remember, that's a constitutionally enshrined voice in the Australian Constitution, which requires a referendum. Uh, we will start at the beginning of a treaty and agreement-making process, complex and will take a long time but I have a very firm view in my mind of how we should do that. And finally, a national process of truth-telling. This will be something that will change our nation. This will be something that will spark the imagination of everyone. And the support already in the community, in the corporate sector and in the non-government sector 
for an enshrined voice in the parliament is just enormous. The next steps are these. Have a look at the work that's already been done. Uh, make sure you consult and talk to the original people that put the Uluru Statement together. I've already started that process. And make sure that you consult widely on what the question should be, what the timing should be, and, of course, there is a legislative process that we have to go through as well. Labor has a First Nations caucus, and that includes the now Attorney General of Australia, it includes me, and it includes many other people in the Labor caucus. So we will be using that uh, part of our mechanism to make sure that we are driving forward. And, of course, most importantly, uh, talking to the Shadow Cabinet, talking to the leader and making sure that we move forward together in terms of this nation-building pr process. And, Linda Burney, let me ask you just finally, this election result is also going to see more women entering Parliament, and it's women in particular who appear to have been the ones really driving the Morrison government out of power. How will the incoming Labor government respond to the, the loud voice we've heard from women at this election? Well, I was just watching your coverage this afternoon of last night, and I think Tanya Plebisek said it very well. Labor's agenda in terms of women um, is very much about pay equity. It's very much about making sure that women... Uh, sectors that are dominated by women in the workforce uh, are paid properly. It's about childcare. But it's also really importantly, David, about implementing the 55 recommendations of the Jenkins Review and making sure that we think carefully and work uh, stridently on the culture of the workplace at Parliament House. But it's also about addressing issues of family and uh, domestic violence, and in particular, the effects it has on family and children. Linda Burney, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. We invited more than a dozen senior coalition figures to join us. None were available. The New South Wales Liberal Treasurer, Matt Keane, has agreed to speak to us tonight. He's a leading Liberal moderate and has also been a critic of the Morrison government on its approach to climate change and an integrity commission. Matt Keane, welcome. How much blame do you think Scott Morrison should carry for this result and how much should be shared by the rest of the party? Well, at the end of the day, it's the party's uh, position that uh, has got us into the trouble. Um, uh, leading at this time is very difficult. We're seeing uh, the Boris Johnson government struggling in the polls, the Biden administration struggling in the polls, and so too was the Morrison uh, government. But uh, that's no excusing the fact that uh, the Liberal Party has lost seats in our city areas, in our heartland seats, because we've moved away from those communities. Uh, we've moved away from them, so they've gone and found an alternative. And why do you think that was in those particular communities? I think because we didn't have uh, strong and decisive policies when it came to tackling climate change. I think we did not listen to women across the electorate and the issues that they're facing uh, and, and coming up with sincere policies to address those issues. And I also think integrity in politics matters and not having a strong position on having a tough, independent watchdog on the beat was uh, very damaging for us. Um, it was very hard to sell our policies to educated communities in our heartland and seeds uh, when they wanted strong action on climate change, fairer go for women and also a strong integrity watchdog. So specifically, what does the Liberal Party need to do to win back those lost voters and can it be done with someone like Peter Dutton as the leader? I think it can be done with someone like Peter Dutton. He's a pragmatic man. Uh, but what we need to do is heed the lesson that the community has sent us. If we want to be a broad-based political party, we need to represent the diversity of the community. And that means if you go too far to the right, you're going to alienate people in the centre. We can't afford to do that if we want to continue to win elections. So, specifically on climate change, the first of those issues you mentioned, what would you like to see the Coalition do federally? 
we clearly need to have a stronger uh, 2030 target and we need to have policies that will help us get there. That's what we've done here in New South Wales. Uh, but we need to take this issue seriously at the federal level. The community's clearly rejected the position on climate that we've taken to the electorate and we need to learn from that. We need to come up with better policies just like the states have done and we need to get on with the job of setting us up to grab the huge opportunities that are emerging because of this global transition to a low carbon future. Well just finally the problem here is at a federal level the nationals won't have a bar of that they won't budge so should the Liberals stick with the coalition or break the coalition in opposition? We should absolutely stick with the coalition. In New South Wales, we came up with climate policies uh, that were supported by the National Party, they were supported by the Conservative wing of the Liberal Party and also the moderate wing of the Liberal Party. We settled that issue here in New South Wales. So it can be done. What we need to do is find the way forward on addressing this issue at the federal level for the coalition government, and that's the path to victory if we can get it right. Matt Keane, thank you. Thanks, David. The crossbench from the last parliament will all return, including Greens leader Adam Bant and Zali Stegall, who held on to Warringah. But their numbers are set to swell. Eight new crossbenches are already confirmed after the teal wave swept across the country and the Greens added two more seats to their lower house numbers. And there's the possibility of one more, with the seat of Brisbane still in play. A crossbench of 16 would be the biggest crossbench in Australia's history. We've got two of those crossbenchers joining us now. Greens leader Adam Bant and the new member for Wentworth, Allegra Spender. Congratulations to you both and uh, welcome. Allegra Spender, let me start with you. Uh, the independents have crushed li the Liberal moderates, particularly in those inner urban seats. What can you now achieve with this crossbench force? Look, I think that we can really speak for the community. Certainly that's what I'm going to be speaking for, the community in terms of climate, integrity and a future-focused economy. And frankly, I think the result um, yesterday has really shown that the community has moved beyond climate wars and wants real action on climate in this parliament in this decade. And that's something I think that we will very much be able to achieve and drive throughout this parliament. Adam Bant, the Greens are now in a more powerful position. You'll have some company in the lower house, three Greens MPs at least. But if Labor gets to a majority in the house, will it need the crossbench? Well, that's ultimately going to be up to Labor and what the final vote is. I think it's a very clear signal, though, that there is a role for third voices in Parliament, in both the Senate and the House. Uh, the Greens will be in balance of power in the Senate, potentially in our own right, depending on how seats fall across the country. Um, so I think there's a very clear message from this that uh, Labor's vote went down, the Liberals' vote went down, the parties and the independents that put coal and gas and climate action on the table and inequality and integrity went up and I think that's a message that the next government needs to hear. Well Adam Band just on that Labor says it will stick to what it took to the election it believes it has a mandate for its its policies its position on climate change it's not as ambitious as you would like so what can you do to push this new government further? Well, look, the big issue is coal and gas. Coal and gas are the main causes of the climate crisis. Over the last two years, we've seen the US President Joe Biden say we need to cut uh, methane usage and try and get the countries of the world to sign a global pledge. Um, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson saying this needs to be the time that we get out of coal. And meanwhile, you had Liberal and Labor taking a very different approach, saying we want to keep opening more coal and gas mines. In the middle of a climate crisis, we can't open more coal and gas mines. And this has to be the parliament where we grapple with what it means to transition uh, away from coal and gas in a way that supports the workers and communities. And that is going to be on the agenda. Allegra Spender, will you, as independents and other crossbenchers, the Greens as well, inevitably have to work together to use the weight of numbers to deliver the change and drive the change you want? Look, I think we will need to work together and, I, and I'm there to work with all sides of, of the parliament because I think that's what being an effective crossbencher is. I'm not the opposition, I'm not seeking to be the opposition, I'm seeking to stand for the issues that are important in this area, in Wentworth, and then very much work constructively, collaboratively with the parliament, with business, with community, bringing those voices together to coming to answers that suit and manage all the expectations of those different parties. And a final question to you, uh, Allegra Spender. Do you see what we've seen in this election result as a permanent change in the political landscape or a, a particular reaction to a set of circumstances? 
Look, I think it will depend on how well um, the independents do in terms of achieving great things, I think, in this parliament. But what I, what I think that the community has spoken for is saying we want more representation. I think that has been across the board. You see that with the drop in the, in the um, votes of the major parties and the rise of, of the independents and also of you know, the Greens and other minor parties. So I think that this is going to be a big question of how those major parties address themselves. But I think that independents have a huge role to play in holding governments to account ongoing and I, I certainly hope to be doing that. Allegra Spender, Adam Band, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks David. Thank you. Let's bring back Andrew Probin and Laura Tingle. Some last thoughts from both of you. Andrew, the Nationals held their ground. The Liberals we know were crushed in WA, uh, went backwards in Victoria and then the Teal Independence getting them in both Melbourne and Sydney. What lies ahead for the Coalition now? Well, first of all, Dave, they've got to decide whether they remain in coalition. Now, we heard from senior Liberal Simon Birmingham, who's talking to you on Insiders this morning. He was indicating that he wants to uh, have the Liberals sit aside from and away from the Nationals, perhaps to delve into questions of policy on climate, for example. The problem for the Liberal Party is that a whole generation of moderate Liberals have been obliterated in Saturday's result, including Josh Frydenberg, who was a future Prime Minister, some say, definitely a, a leadership contender. The risk for the coalition is that with these, co these moderates having left Parliament, tossed from Parliament, the Liberal Party goes even further right, and that would be a, a potentially a mistake and not heeding the lessons of the election of these uh, teal independents. It's, it's going to be fascinating, I mean, if they do stay in coalition, in opposition, the Nats holding their seats but the Libs going backwards changes the balance uh, there. We might even in fact see the Nats wanting more front bench representation than they've previously had. But Laura, for Anthony Albanese, he heads to Tokyo tomorrow for a meeting of the quad leaders. He really needs to hit the ground running here. What are the challenges ahead for the new Prime Minister? Well, I think the fact that he does have to go to the quad reflects the different way Prime Minister's jobs are defined these days, David, that, you know, so much is going to be uh, pressing in from overseas. Uh, at the quad meeting, he's obviously got to uh, reset as much as he can Australia's, uh, the Australian government's relationship with uh, the various partners in the quad. Uh, they wanted to discuss Ukraine, and this is an issue where the four quad members don't actually see completely eye to eye, uh, so that's going to be an interesting conversation. Plus, they're going to try to use that uh, that forum, uh, both he and the foreign minister elect uh, Penny Wong, to start sending out the new message Australia wants to send uh, in this, under this new government about about both engagement in Southeast Asia as well as the Pacific. So it's a, it's going to be a, a lot of messages to uh, get into when you're not in the in, into uh, when you're not used to the world of uh, international diplomacy. And, and Laura, just briefly, I mean that's the foreign policy side of things, but the economic pressures are also going to be building for this new prime minister to face. They are, and uh, he's getting his uh, economics team uh, on the job on Monday as well to start looking at the budget and really focusing on where the government's priorities can lie once they've actually had a, look, a really good look at the books. All right, plenty to uh, uh, plenty on the plate for the incoming government. Laura Tingle, Andrew Proben, thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. That's it from us at the ABC Election Centre. It's back to your local newsrooms now with the rest of the day's news. And here are the top stories on ABC News. Incoming Prime Minister Anthony Albanese says Labor is ready to govern as it moves closer to securing a majority. The party has secured 72 seats so far. The Northern Territory seat of Lingiari is the latest to fall. Labor leads four more or needs four more seats to form government without the support of the crossbench. They remain ahead in six others, which are still too close to call. The outgoing Prime Minister has fought back tears while thanking his local church community for their support. He will stand down as leader at the next party meeting. Many Liberal frontbenchers have been reflecting on the party's future, with the Coalition losing 15 seats so far, many to inner-city independents who campaign on climate change and gender equality. 
Newly elected independent and Greens candidates have declared last night's election a result of rejection of the major parties. The Greens picked up two lower house seats in Queensland and are hopeful for a third in Brisbane. Three of the party senators have been re-elected and it's likely it could pick up another three. Greens leader Adam Bant says it's the best result in his party's history. And the US President Joe Biden has congratulated the incoming Prime Minister. The President will meet Australia's 31st Prime Minister on Tuesday in Tokyo as part of the next Quad meeting, which also includes the leaders of Japan and India. Mr Albanese says he will use the meeting to send a message to the world. And US President Joe Biden has arrived in Japan tonight for the Quad Leaders Summit. The president's first trip to Asia since taking office, he's going to spend time with the new South Korean leader, Yoon Sik Yul, and discuss North Korea. Our armed forces stand side by side, standing sentinel on a peninsula for seven decades to preserve the peace and make possible that shared prosperity. China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific will be on the agenda at the Quad talks between the US, Japan, Australia and India. The US will launch a new Indo-Pacific economic bloc that will exclude China and a maritime tracking system to curb China's illegal fishing will be unveiled with allegations that Beijing is behind 95% of illegal fishing in the region. Advocates say the next president of the Philippines, Bongbong Marcos, must change the country's war on drugs, which has seen thousands of killings, but little progress on stopping the trade. Mr Marcos is expected to largely continue the outgoing leader Rodrigo Duterte's brutal approach, which critics are labelling a war on the poor. From Manila, our East Asia correspondent Bill Bertels has more. In the heart of one of Manila's poorest districts, we're on our way to meet a drug dealer. Buyers and sellers of methamphetamine used to trade openly on these streets, but it's now been pushed further underground. 49-year-old Bilog takes us inside the tiny humid room he shares with two teenage sons. The drug war changed things a lot. It devastated my family and every parent in the Philippines who sells drugs to feed their kids. So most of the people here who were alleged by police to be dealing were arrested. Everyone was scared. Bilog himself spent two years behind bars in the war on drugs ordered by the outgoing president, Rodrigo Duterte. Thousands of people were killed and the president often fanned the flames of violence. If it involves human rights, I don't give a shit. But still, Bilog deals meth, as do his sons, and he uses it too. The dealers who were jailed, of course, they returned to selling drugs after getting out of prison. It's our basic source of income. <laughs> At a church across town, a look at how much worse things could have been. People here lost sons, brothers and fathers. The relatives of the people here today were all shot dead in the drug war. Some were small players, some they say weren't involved at all. Their bodies were buried quickly and they never received a proper service. So this is all about trying to give their relatives a bit of dignity. Definitely it's the poor who are mainly affected here. Father Flavi Villanueva is one of the Philippines' most vocal critics of Duterte's war on drugs. And with the end of the Duterte presidency, he sees little hope for change under Bongbong Marcos. The drug war will continue, however, it needs to be diagnosed properly. There was already a misdiagnosis from the very beginning. During his election campaign, Bongbong Marcos, known as BBM, pledged to target the bigger fish of the drug trade. But with the outgoing President Duterte's daughter, the new deputy to Marcos, the drug war is set to continue. Duterte did the tough part, OK, to shake the country, to shake the people, to wake them up. Vince Avena, an anti-drugs campaigner and Marcos supporter, says the drug war remains relatively popular, but he agrees it needs refining. In the next administration, on the BBM and Asara Duterte, they themselves said that they will uh, face it and they will solve it with love. 
that sinks into me as a more holistic approach. Marcos has suggested more rehab funding as part of an overhaul, but for now, the drug trade, so deeply entrenched in the poorest pockets of the country, goes on. Bill Bertels, ABC News, Manila. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says the war against Russia can only be resolved through diplomacy. But his government will not agree to a ceasefire deal with Moscow that involves giving up territory. Heavy fighting is taking place around the main city under Ukrainian control in the province of Luhansk. Russian forces are stepping up efforts to seize the whole of the eastern Donbass region. In the AFL, Hawthorne has delivered a surprise win over Brisbane to snap its four-game losing streak. Greater Western Sydney ran over the top of the West Coast Eagles in Mark McVeigh's first game as senior coach, while the Hawks' key forward Mitch Lewis kicked four goals in the close five-point win. In Tasmania, it was a tale of two sides heading in opposite directions on the ladder. Having won their past five games, the Lions got out to a hot start, which could have been worse if it wasn't for some key stops. The goal umpires called touched. What a good call it was. The Hawks kicked their way back into the game, aided by some questionable decisions. I'm not sure it was worthy of it anyway. That wouldn't be a free kick in, in Oz kick. But... A run of three consecutive goals put Hawthorne's nose in front at half time. Ruckman Darcy Fort putting his body on the line. He's claiming it before it goes over the line and then Fort comes in oh, no. and has a fresh air <laughs> shot. So Raiders kick the goal. <laughs> Brisbane put the pressure on the Hawks in the third term, but the Hawks showed plenty of pluck against their more fancied opponents. Wingard in splendid isolation goes bang and they're back in front. Mitch Lewis delivering the exclamation mark on a statement win. Lot system brought to life. With the Leon Cameron era over, the opportunity was there for Mark McVeigh to begin a new chapter, and he couldn't have written a better start. All the way back, that'll work. Green slides it through three in three minutes. The Giants sprinkled some seasoning on the first half. Oh, a bit going on there. <laughs> booting 14 goals to five to stretch the lead beyond 50 points. The good news for Giants fans. There's another half to come. The bad news for West Coast fans, this could get worse before it gets better. Fortunately for Eagles fans, it did get better, with Isaiah Winder kicking his way to three goals. But it was too little too late as the Giants managed their highest score this season, leaving West Coast with more questions than answers. Fraser Fife, ABC News. Former rugby union player Lachlan Miller has played a starring role in Cronulla's 25 points to 18 win over the Gold Coast. The Sharks bounced back from last week's loss to Canberra while the Titans' disappointing season continued. All eyes were on Lachlan Miller, the former Rugby Sevens Olympian, making his NRL debut. The Sharks fullback ran for an impressive 131 metres in the first half against the Titans with the score six all. The 27-year-old kept up the pace after the break and scored his first try. The Tokyo Olympian makes this a massive lead for the Sharks. The Gold Coast gave the Sharks a late scare. And we have got a grandstand finish. But halfback Nico Hines sealed the win for Cronulla. He strikes it nicely. In his 250th game, the Raiders' milestone man Josh Papali'i put on his best against the Rabbitohs. A trademark effort! And he was equally damaging in defence. But it was a team effort that capped off Canberra's first half in style. And Canberra score a sensational try! The Raiders continued to run rings around Souths. Xavier Savage burning them off! Their third straight win, this one 32 to 12. We're finally uh, stringing it together, you know, and it's uh, very pleasing to see. Uh, you know, I love this club with all my heart. Defending premiers, the Penrith Panthers have moved two wins clear at the top of the ladder after a convincing 20-point victory over the Sydney Roosters. Penrith 5'8's Jerome Luai scored a double giving New South Wales Blues selectors something to think about after Tom Trevojevic dislocated his shoulder in Manly's two-point loss to the Eels. Uh, that's season-ending by the look of it. Oh, no. 
Manly's confirmed the fullback needs surgery and is set for a long stint on the sidelines. Chloe Hart, ABC News. Australia's swimming sprint kings have announced themselves at the Australian Championships in Adelaide. With no Carl Chalmers in the 100 metre freestyle event, William Yang claimed his first national title while a 16 year old sensation lived up to the hype. National sport reporter David Mark has the story. For the first time in years, freestyle sprinting star Kyle Chalmers skipped the 100 metre final at the National Championships to play country football. William Yang, second in the 50 fly behind Chalmers. That's opened the door for the likes of William Yang and a 16-year-old Queenslander who's already drawing comparisons to Chalmers and Ian Thorpe. Flynn Southam, the men's 100 metre freestyle. He broke Kyle Chalmers' national age record in this event. A spot in the Australian teams at the World Championships in Budapest next month and the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in July was on the line. Yeah, we'll get there in 30 seconds, south and third. Yeah, been a pretty rough three years. <laughs> uh, yeah, finally, you know, I did like a 0.8 PB today and made the team just, just amazing. Yang will make his first Australian team. He'll be joined by dual Olympic relay bronze medalist Zach Inserti and Southam, who will make his first Australian senior team as a relay swimmer. Yeah, it's awesome. I can't, in year 12 and at 16 years old to go to the Com Games, just represent my country, do as best as I can and just make my friends, family and country proud. The world record holder for the 100 back won the 400 medley. The triple Olympic gold medalist Kayla McEwen is no stranger to Australian teams. Last night she did what was required to secure her spot for the 200 metre backstroke at Budapest and Birmingham. Hopefully in a few weeks time with a bit more race I can produce a faster time. The national titles end tonight with the naming of the Australian team for the World Championships and the Commonwealth Games. All eyes will be on Kyle Chalmers and whether he decides to swim the 100 butterfly at the Worlds. If he does, pop star Cody Simpson will miss out. David Mark, ABC News, Adelaide. Melbourne City has beaten Adelaide United 2-1 in extra time to book a spot in next weekend's A-League men's grand final against Western United. It was nil all heading into the second leg of the semi-final and Adelaide United edged ahead shortly after half-time. Melbourne City levelled the score with Marco Tolio before Socceroo striker Jamie McLaren scored the match winner. Last night, Western United upset the inner form Melbourne victory 4-1 to win the two-leg semi-final four goals to two. And Matilda's defender Ellie Carpenter didn't want to miss out on the celebrations despite suffering a knee injury in Lyon's 3-1 victory over Barcelona in the Champions League final. Carpenter played only 13 minutes of the decider in turn. Amadine Henri scored a spectacular goal as Lyon won the European title for the eighth time. Taking a look at the synoptic chart, the area of high and mid-level cloud over eastern Queensland has moved out over the Tasman Sea. That's been driven by upper level and surface troughs. A large area of low cloud remains over southeast Queensland and the northeast of New South Wales. Weak surface troughs and an upper air disturbance are also creating mid-level cloud across parts of WA, South Australia and the southern parts of the Territory. And a cold front is crossing the southwest of WA. Looking around the states for tomorrow in Queensland, showers and cool to mild temperatures in the southeast, a late shower and cool conditions in the southwest, mostly sunny and warm in the northeast, mostly sunny too and cool to mild in the northwest. Cool conditions throughout New South Wales and the ACT, showers in the northeast, fog then sunny in the southeast, mostly sunny though in the southwest and cloud cover for the northwest. In Victoria, cool temperatures throughout, mostly sunny in the west, foggy conditions then sunny in the east. Cool in the south of Tasmania, mostly cloudy in the southwest, frost then sunny in the southeast, mostly sunny and also cool to cold temperatures in the north. 
Fog, then sunny and cool in South Australia's southeast. Mostly sunny elsewhere, mild conditions for the central parts and mild to warm in the west and also the north. In Western Australia, showers and cold temperatures in the southwest. A late shower expected and cool to mild conditions in the south. Showers with cool to mild temperatures in the northwest and mostly sunny and very warm for the northeast. And mostly sunny conditions for the Northern Territory with isolated showers over Arnhem Land. Looking ahead to Tuesday's forecast for the capital cities, showers in Brisbane as well as Sydney. It will be partly cloudy for Canberra. Melbourne, mostly sunny partly cloudy for Hobart, cloud increasing for Adelaide, showers easing for Perth and sunny in Darwin with a top of 34 degrees. You've been watching a national edition of ABC News. If you'd like to watch your local edition, just go to ABC iView where you can stream it live or catch up anytime. I'm Lara Hines. Thanks for joining us.